Welcome to episode one, Neuro Women Natter, with Tony Horn and Charlie Hart. Me and Charlie have come to the concept that we're going to start this by me and her just having a general conversation. What we want to do is kind of just, it's a bit like listening in on two friends having a conversation about their life. Um, and then as it evolves, obviously, we'll invite people in to come in and be a guest. But we wanted to start from the beginning, from the basics of um, our kind of our experience, I think, more than anything. And we're actually going to start from the very beginning, aren't we? Yeah, we are. So like Charlie, uh, we, we've had this slight conversation about this. But what is what's your earliest memory? of now when you replay and I like to call it like do you know when you replay that movie after the diagnosis you yeah go, well that makes sense yeah what's yeah your, what's your what would say what's your earliest episode that you replay and go well now I know why I did that so I had to think about this when uh, I did my very first blog about my lived experience being late diagnosed autistic and I went right back to the very beginning so I'm not even in school yet 18 month development check and yes I can remember things that happened when I wasn't even two yet which is a bit weird but uh, obviously some of the things uh, anecdotes my parents have talked about over the years and my mum likes to tell this one in my 18 month development check so they give you building bricks and tell you to build mm -hmm. and they expect a tower they they expect you to put one brick on top of the other and uh I didn't do that because I'd watched a documentary about the Great Wall of China. So I put mine in a line, in a long curved line along the floor. And apparently that meant that I wasn't meeting my development milestones because I hadn't built upwards. So I pointed to it and said, Great Wall of China. <laughs> you are, by what you've just said, people say, they say, how do you remember that far back? Yeah. Because I really do. I remember such of the, the most significant things. And I look back now and I find it funny because we obviously me and my mum and my dad will talk about it. And they said the things that you should do when you're little. And and I was like, like what? And my dad said to me, if you were talking, if you if you were talking to me or any other adult, if we weren't directly looking at you, you'd full blown stop, grab you, grab whoever it is his face and pull them towards you. Yeah. Say, look at me. And then you'd wow. start all over again. And he said, it was so annoying. Yeah. He said, because we were listening to you, but we weren't looking at you. So you would make sure that we, because in your head, if we weren't looking at you, we weren't listening to you. And you'd start completely all <laughs> over again. And I think my, you know, when you talk about special interests and, and, and obsessions, you know, that they, you know, the stigmatism of, you know, you must really love public transport if if you're wired differently oh yeah and things are you like a train that, right? autistic yeah. are, you, are you a train spotter no I'm not right I don't even like going on the train um but my mum said that I got obsessed with this one song she said you must and I actually I vividly remember it as well do you remember the final countdown it's the oh final yeah countdown. I sometimes do that when we have uh, like drunken YouTube karaoke at home even <laughs> now right brilliant right so that must have been my first obsession because I remember in my mum and dad's house, they had the records underneath the record player, so they were all stacked. Mm. And um, mum said she'd come in and there'll be records all over the floor because I would have just picked them all out until I got to that one and then I'd shove it in her face to say, put it on. And then, and then I said to her, well, if I kept doing it, why didn't you just put it at the front? Right. Well, yeah. And she went. She went because my records had to be in alphabetical order. They, yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> there's no like... there's no mystery where you got your neurotype from. Us, though we don't look no. it off the pavement. Yeah. So she was like, "It had to be in alphabetical order." I said, "But, but for you to have that where it needed to be, you'd come in to a floor full of records because I wanted you to play that record." She said, "I done this every day for near and on three months," mm -hmm. and I was like, "Well." just makes a load of sense now doesn't it I was mine was Charlotte's Web I read the book and I watched the film Charlotte's Web the, the animated version and uh, I taped the soundtrack so literally held up my cassette player to the TV taped soundtrack so literally held up my cassette player to it all and then I used to reenact it on my own in the garage so I'd play all the different parts I knew all the songs I could probably still sing them now and I must have been 
five, maybe six. So the Dukes of Hazard, uh, I was obsessed with that. It wasn't all girly stuff. I was into quite a lot of things that were more typically aimed at boys. And I loved the Dukes of Hazard. So I spent an entire weekend learning how to jump in through the car window like they did. Program. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I bet your parents hated it. Yeah. But my mum said to me, like, I, it was obvious that I liked routine from the beginning. She said, because you'd go to bed, you wouldn't even know what the time is. And I know now, by talking to her, I know you used to know now what you used to trigger it. She said, you used to, she went, you couldn't even tell the time, but you'd ask to go to bed at a certain time every day. You're like, well, I'm going to go to bed now. And she was like, we didn't understand it. And when I when I really look back at it, my dad used to work nights. My dad used to work at Ford's. He was a Ford member that he used to go to work when the bill finished. Oh, so right. you remember the bill with the walking so legs that, at the beginning? Um, so, but I, and, yeah, yeah, but there was a routine. I'd sit on his lap, watch the the intro i'd watch the feet because i used to always like what so but I, and, yeah, yeah but there was a routine i'd sit and then turn onto the program i said i need to go to bed now so i wouldn't watch the bill i just wanted yeah. to watch the, the the intro and then i'd go to bed so there was a trigger straight away saying oh i do this now yeah and i wonder if mom... it would make you sleepy if you watched that intro now <laughs> 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 probably <laughs> or it will trigger some kind of emotion I'll probably go on oh, we'll go to bed um but I remember my dad saying one day that he wanted he wasn't going to see me at all for two days and could I stay up with him and I remember just feeling really uneased mm. of I want to stay up but I don't want to stay up and I remember that feeling really early thinking well I need to go to bed I need to go to bed and it just going around around my head and getting really upset with my dad because he wouldn't let me go to bed because he wanted to spend more time with me well looking back now I think you selfish cow yeah. <laughs> your father's just trying to tell you he wants to spend more time with you but in my head it was, no I need to go to bed the routines now. can become compulsions almost I think yeah but it's interesting when when you're autistic and ADHD because sometimes the ADHD part of us craves novelty and spontaneity but we actually need the, the routines and rituals. Yeah. It's a real internal conflict at times, isn't it? It really is. You know, I, my, my dad said to me that he couldn't control me when it comes to water parks and things like that. I wanted to go down the highest slide that was mm. there. I wanted to do all this. You know, I, my, my dad said to me that he couldn't control me when it comes to water parks and things like that, I wanted to go down the highest slide that was mm. there. The rides at the theme park, I wanted to go on the biggest ones. And I'm seeing that in my youngest as well. We yeah, we too. were I was so privileged enough that when we were younger, we were taken we were taken to America and we took my two to uh, Disneyland last year. And Louis was so upset that he couldn't go on the Hulk rise because he wasn't tall enough and he just wants to do absolutely anything that's thrill seeking he's so much like me but the worst thing is that me and my husband are both like that yeah which is quite dangerous yeah so me and mine although i i if i'm strapped into a ride you know if there's a harness i feel safe but i don't um i struggle with cycling down a, a steep hill quickly or something like that in case the car pulls out on me but I think that's more PTSD from an accident. My adrenaline-seeking, sensory-seeking brain wants to go full pelt down that hill on my bike. Yeah, my 15-year-old is really brave and adventurous as well. Oh, she's 16 next month. But... Wow. Yeah. It is, and I, I think for me as well now, I'm so overprotective with my two because I, I I see accidents happening before they happen. And people are like, how do you have that intuition to be <laughs> one living with my dad, who was the most clumsiest man I've ever known in my life? Like if if it could if it could happen, he's done mm. it. Right. And I think because I lived with him with him for so long, um, I now preempt accidents and I, I, I know that I'm overprotective sometimes. But anyway, Charlie, me and you've digressed and we knew we yeah, were gonna yeah, do this, yeah. right? <laughs> I knew this to was going to be a meandering <laughs> conversation. Yeah. We need definitely. to go back. We need to go back. Right, so back to school. So when was... I no, know, don't send me back to school. <laughs> I know, I know, right? I know, got to do it. Happiest days it. of your life. All right, it's all downhill from here then. <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. The happiest day of my life is when I left. Um, yeah. Uh, when was the definite moment 
because I know where mine was and I talk about this in my talks when I when I go out and do keynotes um the moment that you knew that you were different from everyone else how old was you and what was you doing at the time because I know I can remember what I was doing I can remember my first day of school, so I would have been about four and a half, I believe. And that school had like an adventure playground next to it. So I'd walk past it many times. It was in the same straight street I grew up in and I couldn't wait to go and play in it. But I didn't actually want to be in the thick of um, all the kids playing. I wanted to sit underneath a great big old oak tree scraping the mud away from the roots so that I could have a look at the root structure so so there I was all my friends uh, all my new school uh, colleagues really I hadn't really made friends yet but they were all off playing in the adventure playground and I wanted to scrape dirt under a tree on my own about six and I think I don't know if this is more it's probably more to do with my dyslexia than than my other neurodivergence but um I remember there's used to go down this corridor and in the corridor outside the schools were all these boxes of books. So it started one end and it went right down to the other Mm. end. Um, And I remember that we had to go to our our colour, which the colour was on the box and you'd get your book. And I remember standing there one day and I was here on the corridor and my close friend Kate, I remember only having really one friend in juniors and her name was Kate. I don't remember anyone else or talking to anyone else but her. And she was down here. Yeah. And I remember thinking, why are all the kids up there on these books? And why am I still on this book? And thinking, well, why why can't I do those books? And I remember going up to them and getting one out thinking, I can't read this. But I, it, I that was the minute I thought, that I'm not right. I remember saying that to myself. I'm not right. This this isn't. I I need to. Why why can't I do it? And then I remember feeling punished because Mr. Rutledge. I'll always remember Mr. Rutledge. Remember the Wombles. Wombles. Yeah. Wombles. Wombles. Yeah. We used to always say he looked like a Womble because he used to have like Womble hair, grey hair. <laughs> And he always wore a white science coat, right? <laughs> always. And he was my teacher. He was lovely. He was a really lovely man. But I used to have to stay behind at playtime to read to him. And everyone, and I could, do you remember the old static classrooms that are in the playground made of metal? Oh, yeah. They still have, we was in one of those. So you could see the playground and you could see all the kids outside. And I remember just keep looking. It was like, stop being distracted. You need to read. But I was thinking, well, everyone's outside playing. But I'm in here made to do work. Why? And just felt like it was always being told I had needed to do more. Mm. And it was so frustrating. And I, I just, from that moment on, I just remember hating school. And it, and I will call her out. I will say her name. There was a deputy head. Um, I'll always remember called Miss Berry. And I remember at lunchtime, I used to chew up my sandwich and go and pretend I was sick in the toilet. Oh. Um, and I'd call one of the lunch ladies in and say, look, I've been sick because I didn't believe you unless they see it, right? I had discussed with that. And I remember hearing her talking to another teacher, calling me out as being a hyper contract. Like, don't believe anything she says. Don't believe her. She's, there's always something wrong with her. So they labelled me as this hyper contract. Well, actually, what about the reason why? I'm constantly saying I'm sick. Why is it I'm saying I want to go home? Um, And I I was looked at as the problem child rather than understanding why it is I didn't want to be there. That's terrible. Yeah, that must have been so hard. My my reading and writing was like the other end of the scale. So I was whipping through all the books and, and running out. But... I would have entire classes where I just stared out of the window and did nothing. And so I have really vivid memories of being held back over break and over lunch because we had to do something like um, long multiplication and I just couldn't start it. There was like a mental block stopping me putting pen to paper. And how the hell I got to the age of 48 without a diagnosis of ADHD, I don't know. Because it's there all over my school reports, has the potential to do well if she would only apply herself. 
could do great things if she didn't allow herself to get distracted by her outside interests. It's just all over my report. He said exactly the same every time, that there was no differ differentiation. It was, she's lazy. She's a lazy learner. And I remember thinking, I'm not bloody lazy. I try so hard to remember these spellings. I try so hard to do this thing. Um, and I, it, I used to go to the school evenings with my mum and dad. And I always say to anybody now, if your child is struggling at school, don't take them to parents' evening because yeah. they'll hear things that they don't want to hear, that they potentially don't hear from their teacher because they're having an adult conversation. And I remember them saying to my mum is that, you know, you, you might want to get her into kind of something else because she's not very academic. Um, I don't think that, she, you know, she's going to be, she's going to achieve university or, or college or anything like that. And they were saying this to my mum at the age of 10. You know, I wasn't even senior school at this point. Um, and I remember thinking, and it, it's a huge, and somebody with authority saying that to you, you go, oh, okay, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I can't do this. Maybe I can't do that. Um, and I remember them saying, like, she's really articulate. You know, she talks a hell of a lot. And like she can explain things to us, but she yeah. she can't be bothered to write it down. Oh. And I'm like, God, I feel like they were being really slow on the uptake there. If you could but it express wasn't recognized, ideas was it and you're articulate, clearly it was an issue with the uh, with reading and writing, mm -hmm. not uh, your cognitive skills. You could think, you know. I completely flunked university because I like I really still needed adult supervision. Yes, I was 18, going on 19 when I started uni, but I didn't know how to do, I didn't know how to look after myself. I didn't know how to do self-directed study. Uh, I couldn't just not go out and get drunk all the time. I, I seriously needed adult supervision. I don't think I'd um, be comfortable with the, my kids when they're 18, going off and living on their own unsupervised. Never, I was never popular. But I was never picked on, not not in the early years. I kind of just faded in the background, mm. if that makes sense. Yeah. I think I purposely kind of just faded. Your wallflower. Yeah. 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 Whereas I was um, always trying to be the centre of attention. But uh, I went to a school with no uniform. So the, the fashion kids, the trendies... They ruled the school with their head bags and their um, Campri uh, ski jackets and their Adidas shell suits. And they looked <laughs> awful. <laughs> Could have done with putting the head bags over their heads. But they had they were what was jeans as well, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who didn't just wasn't good enough, wasn't acceptable. So I was mercilessly bullied. I mean, it was mostly verbal, but it's the verbal stuff that sticks with me. So that whole sticks and stones made break my bones is just utter bullshit, in my opinion, because mm. it's the death by a thousand cuts with people insulting you and telling you you're not good enough. And sometimes in very specific ways, that's what stays with you. Me and you probably had completely different experiences at senior school because I was always in the lower level class. Mm. Right? I was always I was at, at the bottom, bottom of the top set. So I'd got the intellect and I was good at most things, but I couldn't pay attention in the same way that the high flying kids could. And I never did any homework. I was always in detention, like literally not any revision, no homework whatsoever. No. Everyone in my year used to go either sit underneath the, sit underneath where the, what's it called? The underpass, where an underpass near my house. Mm. Or they'd go and sit in the field or around town. And I was never that person that kind of followed the sheep. Because I remember I, I went out a couple of times and I thought, well, this is all right. But the minute I felt awkward or felt cold, I was like, I'm going home. Yeah. Um, and they'd be like, why are you going? What was, I'm like, I'm cold. My body's telling me I'm cold and I'm going to go and sit in the warm. Where to them, it was like, well, that wasn't cool, right? It's not cool to go home. You have to brave it. You have to sit out in it. And I always I was remember never in a group like that. <laughs> I completely no, would be the same if I had been. I used to love being in my bedroom on my own. Same, yeah. 
so I don't give my kids a hard time about it when they want to do that now. Like they've been peopling all day. And if they want to spend a big chunk of time in their room in the evening, that's completely fine. And if to be fair, my mum and dad were quite good. They were never really pushy. They weren't. And going back to the point you were saying about your brother, my brother has cerebral palsy. Mm-hmm. So obviously a lot of my mum and dad's attention was on supporting him because he had physical needs. Um and I and I didn't. So he also went to a specialised school for obviously for him. And we me and him had these conversations because he he never really he didn't have to act differently because he was in a school surrounded by people that were all completely different. They all had different either physical or um other needs. Yeah. Um, it was the same for my brother. He went to special schools, but he he was he's autistic and hyperactive and pretty much enumerate probably got dyscalculia I don't know he can read and write a bit but like a 10 year old and he's 46 but he always went to special schools and he was quite often with kids with down syndrome and various other disabilities so no two kids were in any way alike in those schools they were way more varied than the mainstream schools where you'd got gangs of kids that all looked and acted the same and I think that's why I'm such a huge advocate of getting children out there to mix with different abilities because I remember that I used to go to this this club called Fab so me and my brother I must have been about 12 when we started going and Fab is is a charity run and they have them in lots of different cities Um, and my one was in Southend on Sea remember it really clearly and it was a place where there was a it's like a youth club for children who had siblings that were disabled so that's a good idea you're you're you would both go as siblings right Mm. so I would mix with other children who also had disabled brothers or sisters and would mix with other abled bodied children Mm. and, and things like that and I always think that from I always had a different outlook on people being different because at such a young age I've always been around children who present differently in all sorts of shapes and forms right and I think that's made me more of an empathetic person and more of an understanding person and more of a, a, a genuine person when I, you know, I, I absolutely yeah. respect everybody for who they are, their ability of what they, they can do, et cetera, et cetera. And I remember when moving into my career, I remember having this conversation with a line manager and she says, you have, you have so much more time and energy with, with your team when they tell you that they've got something going on or there's this. And I look back and I think, is it because of my childhood that I'm this person and that how I could be that empathy leader where other people are not because they haven't experienced it. Yeah. So I do definitely. think there is definitely room for having your children be around differences. Mm-hmm. One of my, no, probably my absolute best ever manager, a lady called Alex Horn. I'll tag her on this when it goes on LinkedIn, but she, uh, she was my manager for about six months when there was a gap between IT managers when I worked in IT. And her son is is autistic with quite severe learning disabilities. And she herself experiences uh, profound hearing loss. And she was just the most em- empathetic manager I've ever had. And she was really, really good. It was quite good she didn't really work in that field. So she knew that her team had got the technical expertise and that she was there to be a people manager. So she really did that job properly. Going back to school, I absolutely hated being there. But I think I was at a school that wasn't really bothered. When I look back, I think my, my head teacher got done for fraud. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> um, more than anything, I think it was siphoning money out of the school. So I don't think there was huge... I don't think it was a great school, if I'm honest. But I it, do you have a one teacher, because I have this one teacher that I think changed things for me. Do you have a, a teacher like that that you can go yeah. back and think, actually, if I could say thank you to him, I would? There's quite a few, actually, for me. So I went to a really rough-assed um, 
high school, comprehensive school. I didn't want to go to the grammar school. I probably could have got in. I mainly didn't want to get up at 7.30 to get the bus. But uh, <laughs> there were, it was such a broad range of kids and some of them were really rough assed bullies and there were uh, quite a lot of high flyers as well. But the teachers knew the kids that were struggling with bullying and things like that. So I had this one teacher, Dr. Beebe, and he facilitated a biology club, which was basically the school. The bi in the biology room, we had a snake and a water dragon and a tarantula and some rats and a few other animals, some geckos. And there was a group of kids who wanted to get out of the playground away from the bullies. And they were invited to look after the animals. So me and my best friend did that rather than being a victim of bullying in the playground. And he actually went to Germany when they were taking down the Berlin Wall and he brought us all back a piece of it, just the biology club kids. So of course I've lost it now because ADHD and everything, but uh, he made a real difference. And then I had another teacher, Mr. Mr. Shakespeare, I think he was called, which is Wicked quite funny because he was an English teacher. <laughs> Perfect. And he really, he he had this different way of looking at, at texts like Shakespeare plays and analysing it and mind mapping it and things that really got me interested in literature. So he, I just remember how into it he was. And it is one of these people where I think, OK, a lot of kids think it's cool to be blasé about a lot of things, but... To me, that was, I didn't know about autistic joy then, but he embodied it. He got so, and to me, that's cool. You know, I'd much rather be that weirdo brand of cool where you, you get a yeah. lot of joy out of a particular topic rather than the blasé cool. Don't give no. a shit cool. Yeah. No, the teacher I remember is my English teacher. Really is. And I, I don't think I would have passed my English lit GCSE if it hadn't been for him. Obviously, language, I've fouled <laughs> dreadfully. But my literature, I passed because of him. And I think he understood that. And if I look back at the class that I was in, I could guarantee, I would say, 75% of us were neurodivergent, yeah. either ADHD, or, you know, I would say a big combination of everything in this class. Um, and I think he knew that if he handed us a textbook, or just showed us the film about the book, we wouldn't have we wouldn't have taken it in. And he knew that we obviously learned differently. And he the same embodied the book. So we had of mice and men when I did my GCSE. And even to this day, I can remember the beginning to the end of that book because of him. Yeah. And he used every class, he used to read chapters to us. And um, he was also uh, the media studies. Uh, lecturer as well so he did media studies as well as English and he used to read it to us but read it to us within the, doing the characters so we would embody the character um of, of each of them so you know you would know who he wouldn't have to say the name of who was talking you would know instantly who he was playing when he was doing the book and the whole class was completely silent and just in awe of what he was saying and taking. When it came to my exam, I was like, the, the, I would say probably the only exam that came really easy to me because I could remember absolutely everything and I could express the emotion of the book because of he expressed the emotion through book by showing us the emotion and I just thought you know if I can't find him I've looked everywhere for this teacher to thank him and I can't find him anywhere so anyone knows Mr Morgan who used to go to um, Bromford's or used to teach at Bromford's please let him know that I'm trying to get out of him that's the thing um, neurodiversity really isn't rocket science it's just acknowledging that all minds work differently from one another it, it's that whole scenario isn't it even when even being diagnosed at 17 was well why didn't they pick this up at school you go through that grieving stage again of this could have been so much better I could have got help support da 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 but I remember my mum asking going back to senior school asking if if they thought I was dyslexic and they completely dismissed it hmm. yeah. and I think back then the schools had to pay for it I don't know if that's correct but they might have done and I think a lot of schools weren't invested in it yeah 
I wouldn't be surprised. I think schools, have, I've heard anyway, that schools have got better in terms of dyslexia inclusion. But I just well, think really they need to go that, a lot Charlie, further. But no different. Yeah. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> they they need to, you know how like in the corporate world, if you work in L and D, you need you understand that different people learn in different ways. That there needs to be more of that in schools. Yeah. No, I don't. I know not obviously that the Senko presence is more at school now than it's ever been, right? But if I look at dyslexia, it, it ranges from different county to county. So, for instance, my local council doesn't recognise dyslexia and schools are not allowed to particularly say in their report that they're supporting dyslexia. They have to say that they're supporting a learning difference, oh. a literacy difference a privileged position where I can pay £550 for my child to be diagnosed but there's another child in his class that I know full well that his parents don't have that amount of money and he can't get the diagnosis because they can't afford to pay for the assessment but in every council has a different way of and this is why I think it's just so unfair, and that's why I get on my high horse about postcode it. Postcode lottery. <laughs> it is the postcode lottery. It comes back to that. You know, it's the postcode lottery for dyslexia assessments. It's the postcode lottery for ADHD assessments, for waiting lists, for medication. And it just, this is completely taking a real turn now, isn't it? Um, <laughs> it it's, I could it, start it's, ranting about how hard it's been for my daughter to get diagnosed with ADHD and how she's screwed up her mock GCSEs already and, and we still don't have medication for her. I think me and you have spoke quite a lot about our past and our experiences yeah. today. Um, and I, I'd love to know what our subject's going to be for our, for, our next, for our next podcast. But if anybody out there has got any ideas, any subjects that they want us to talk about or discuss, um, we are openly very honest, the two of us, and we have vowed to be very open and honest about our experiences, things that we know about neurodivergence. Um, so please do throw the questions at us. Anything yes, you want to add, Charlie? Do. Um, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about all of the stuff <laughs> to hear what people want to hear us talk about. Charlie, when we do the relationship one, can we have wine on hand when we do uh, it? Yeah, please? that's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, some means of uh, getting a virtual hug afterwards, I think. As yeah, well. yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, brilliant. It's been absolutely brilliant. Uh, it, Welcome to the first episode and we'll look forward to hearing your thoughts and hopefully subscribing.